sunshine that is in our hearts. And I came to Florida, the sunshine state, and I'm looking forward to seeing the sunshine. I know it's there. And so we'll just have some of our own sunshine this morning. Page 288, everybody ought to know. I don't know if you know this song or not. You can stay seated just as long as you sing out. Here we go. Everybody ought to know. This is how it goes. Everybody ought to know. Everybody ought to know. Everybody ought to know. Everybody ought to know who Jesus is. And we sing it again. of ten thousand everybody ought to know now we're going to sing the second verse but uh, let's sing that chorus I mean that beginning part all the ladies and everybody that wants to can sing the first part but we need some men to echo and maybe some altos okay so enjoy yourself on the second time through everybody ought to know 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 who Jesus is everybody ought to know Everybody ought to know who Jesus on that second vow, second verse on the cross he died for sinners and his blood makes white as snow. Savior, He's the one you ought to know. Keep singing now. Everybody ought to know. Everybody ought to know. Everybody ought to know. Wonderful singing and a wonderful way to start. I want to say I'm so glad to be back at Memorial, so glad to be in Ocala. What a blessing it is to be here, and we thank the Lord for it. And I want you to pray for Brother Comfort. His knee's not doing so good, so be lifting him up in prayer and uh, just ask the Lord to take away the pain. But we're going to have Brother Drew Hay now. It's been probably 2016, I think, was the last time I was here. And uh, it takes some churches a little bit longer to get over me than others. But uh, it's a, a blessing to be able to be back. And I'm so thankful, so thankful to the Lord. And I'm glad to have Drew Hay. Drew Hay is an evangelist. And just in case you wonder, Drew and I married sisters. Drew married the youngest sibling, and I married the second oldest uh, girl in the family. And so Drew is an evangelist, been in evangelism now three years. And we're looking forward to how he's going to minister to our hearts in Sunday school. Drew, come ahead. Amen. Take your Bibles. Let's go to the book of Jeremiah this morning. Jeremiah chapter 29 in the Word of God. And can I say what a privilege it is to be able to open up the Word of God to you this morning. And I'm praying, been praying this week and praying especially this morning that God would do something special in our midst. And uh, really any time that we set aside a specific amount of time to get into the Word of God and to seek the Lord, it's an opportunity for God to really show up and to do something special in our midst. And so uh, if I could just put a plug in this morning, I hope that you plan to be here for every single service that you possibly can. Rearrange the schedule, come in late, do what you got to do, just be here and allow God to do what it is He wants to do in your heart. If we'll come to a week like this and say, 
say, God, <laughs> before the, the, the first message is ever preached, before I, I come into the first service, Lord, whatever it is you want to do in my heart this week, I'm willing to say yes. Whatever it is you put your finger on, there's nothing that's off the table. There's nothing that's non-negotiable. Lord, whatever it is that you want this week, that's what I want. I'm telling you, we can have revival with attitudes and hearts like that. Uh, but Jeremiah 29 is where we're going to begin this morning. And uh, really, gonna, as, as we begin, I want to talk to you about something that it, it doesn't really seem to make sense. It doesn't seem like these two things would go together. Uh, I, before I went into evangelism, and I was, worked for about five years as an assistant pastor in the eastern part of Pennsylvania, up there by Philadelphia, and learned a lot of things, and I uh, was involved in a lot of different things uh, in, in the ministry, and, and it really was a wonderful time that, that the Lord used in my life. But uh, I remember one particular summer, we held a vacation Bible school every summer. And uh, that was something that a lot of that fell on me, and uh, I got to kind of coordinate and, and, and figure out how we're going to get all these kids in here and teach and preach the Bible to them and feed them and take care of them and then get them back home. And uh, it, was, it was a great week, but man, it was a busy week. It was, uh, to be honest with you, sometimes it was a little bit of a stressful week, and I was running around trying to get things done and, and trying to make it all happen and trying to make sure everybody was in their place and that everything was running smoothly, and I... Uh, it, I lost my car keys. <laughs> lost my car keys. And uh, let, let me tell you, it was frustrating because just a couple weeks prior, uh, as, the, as a, as a you know, young, dumb young man, uh, I had been using my other key to try to kind of pry something out of a little crack, you know, and, and I was using it as a pry bar. I never use your car key as a pry bar. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, I didn't know any better, and so I was using that, uh, that key as a pry bar, and I broke that key. <laughs> so my first one's broken, and now my second key is lost. So my car is sitting there in the church parking lot, and I can't move it. And it's VBS week, and I have things to do. I have places to be. And can I tell you, it was stressful. <laughs> it was... It was um, um, it tried my sanctification a little bit. Can I, can I put it that way? Is, is that a spiritual way to say it here this morning? And I couldn't find the keys all week long. I mean, I looked everywhere. I, I looked in the auditorium. I looked down in the basement. I'm, I, I'm tearing things. I mean, maybe some kid stole them. I, I don't know what in the world happened to these keys. I can't find them anywhere. I'm having to borrow people's vehicles. And it's just, it's, it's a big sticky mess. And I'm, I'm just frustrated. So it comes to the end of the week. We have a great VBS week. We see kids saved. It's amazing. It's awesome. And, and what do you have to do at the end of VBS week? You have to clean up. Yeah, yeah that's, 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 that's always a lot of fun right there. And so we were cleaning up. We were getting everything cleaned up, trying to get everything <laughs> put back together because Sunday's coming, you know, put back together so that we can have church on Sunday. And, and I'm cleaning the restroom in the office. And I get all that, I get, get everything all wiped down, get everything looking good, and I go and I, I go to take the trash out, and I mean, the trash is kind of overflowing at this point, because that's kind of the last thing on the agenda when it comes to VBS week, is taking out the office trash. But hey, it's time to do it now, and I, I pick that bag up, and I hear a jingle. <laughs> and lo and behold, somehow, I guess as I was running in there to, <laughs> between sessions, between things, I had put the keys down, perhaps on the, on the vanity there, and they got knocked off, and right into the trash can they went, hidden under all the paper towels and whatnot that were in there. I was able to find the keys, and I'm telling you, man, it was a great, it was a great moment when I pulled those keys out. You know, I'm sending pictures to people of me and these keys. Ah, I found the keys, guys. It's awesome. I'm not going to have to get this thing towed or you know, whatever. It, it was a great moment. It was a great moment. But, but the, the thought came into my mind, of all the places... <laughs> I, I mean, I looked everywhere, but of all the places I would never have thought to look in the office restroom trash can to find the keys that I needed. And I don't know about you, but I want God's blessing on my life. Would you agree with me this morning? I want God's blessing on my life. I want God's touch on my life. I want God's presence real in my life. But sometimes we can find that in the most unlikely of places. And so I want to show you, I want to take you to a place wherein we find God's blessing, wherein we find God's touch, wherein we, that relationship with God is sweet that perhaps we wouldn't want to go to. 
and is found right here in the book of Jeremiah in chapter 29. The Bible says in verse number 1, if you found that, Now these are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet said unto Jerusalem, unto the residue of the elders which were carried away captives, and to the priests and to the prophets and to all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had carried away captive from Jerusalem to Babylon. And so this, this chapter here that we're going to look at is written to a group of people that, can I put it this way, are in bondage. Yeah. A group of people that the chastising hand of God was upon. A group of people that because of their sin are now experiencing a, a, really a time of punishment. A, a time of of bondage, a time of captivity at the hand of the Babylonians. And did you know that right here in the midst of this passage, we can find blessing? And I want to share with you this morning a, a, a lesson, a message I've entitled, The Blessing of Bondage. The Blessing of Bondage. Two things we wouldn't think would go together. A place perhaps we wouldn't go to find blessing, but a place where we can and we very often see the hand, the mighty hand of God in our lives. And so as we consider this this morning, I want us to skip down a few verses and look at verse number four. The Bible says, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel unto all that are carried away captive. Notice this next phrase, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem unto Babylon. As we consider the blessings and the blessing of bondage this morning, I want you to notice the authority of God in it all. The authority of God. <laughs> Here, Jeremiah is writing to these that have been carried away, and God opens up, addresses them by saying, I'm the one who has caused this. Do you want to know the reason that you're in bondage today? It's, it's, it's my doing. Now, can I say, not every time we find ourselves in bondage, if you would, not every time we find ourselves in a difficult place, and I want to maybe define bondage this morning as trouble that God authors or allows for a specific purpose. It's trouble that God authors or allows for a specific purpose. Sometimes he's the author of it, as, it, as he was here in, in this passage, where Israel had sinned, and had sinned, and had sinned again. And God had been merciful, had been gracious, had given them space, had given them time to repent, but finally he said, I'm going to bring the Babylonians in as a response to your sin and as a response to you turning your back upon me. Sometimes he's the author of it, but sometimes God, if I could put it this way, just kind of allows us to reap the consequences of our choices and of our actions. Not, he's not necessarily the author of the, of the evil, of the, the bad situation we find ourselves in, but he has allowed us to be there. He has allowed us to reap what we've sown. He has allowed us to enter into a place where we wouldn't necessarily choose to, to put ourselves there because he has a purpose for us in that bondage. He has a purpose for us in that trouble. Bondage in our lives can take many forms. It can be some kind of a health issue. It could be a financial struggle. It can be some kind of a family tragedy or family situation. It can take many different forms. But I want us to realize and, and notice the authority of God in the midst of our bondage. That just because we're in a place where we wouldn't necessarily put ourselves, or we're in a place of, of trouble, in a place of turmoil, in a, in a place of trial, it doesn't mean that God has abdicated his throne. It does not mean that God has turned a blind eye, does not understand, does not see what is going on. No, no, he is still in complete control, even in the midst of our bondage, even in the midst of our trials. And we know that he is able to take even the worst of circumstances and bring his glory and our good out of it. This is something that Israel would not have chosen. They didn't want to go to bondage. They didn't want the, the Babylonians to come in. And In fact, we'll see a couple verses later uh, in verse number 8, the Bible says, For thus saith the Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, Let not your prophets and your diviners that be in the midst of you deceive you, 
Neither hearken to the, your dreams which you caused to be dreamed, for they prophesy falsely unto you in my name. I have not sent them, said the Lord. There was a group that was coming and, and, and talking to the children of Israel in bondage and saying, hey, this isn't where we're supposed to be. Hey, this is, this is, God's going to deliver us quickly. This is going to be over quickly. They were sowing lies and saying things that God had not said. But the fact is, God meant for them to be in bondage at this point. God meant for them to be in these uncomfortable circumstances at this point because he had a purpose and he had a plan for his people. Sometimes that bondage is, is just a, maybe a dry time in our spiritual life. You ever been there? Where it just seems like the prayers aren't getting past the ceiling? It seems like you open up the Word of God and it's just not, it's not fresh and it's not new. You feel like He's far away. In those times, He is still up to something in our lives. As we continue on, not only do we notice the authority of God, but I want you to see the admonition of God to his people in verse 5 through 7. He says, I'm the one who has put you there. I'm the one that allowed you to be carried away into Babylon. But verse 5, build ye houses and dwell in them. Plant gardens and eat the fruit of them. Take ye wives and beget sons and daughters and take wives for your sons and give your daughters unto husbands that they may bear sons and daughters that ye be increased, that ye may be increased there and not diminished. And seek the peace of the city, whither I have caused you to be carried away captives. And pray unto the Lord for it, for in the peace thereof shall ye have peace. <laughs> the admonition of God. God says to his people, you may be in bondage. You may find yourselves in Babylon. You may find yourselves in a place where you wouldn't have put yourself. Find yourself in a place where you don't want to be. But that doesn't mean that life is over. And can I say, church, just because we find ourselves in a trial, just because we find ourselves in a difficulty, just because we find ourselves in a dry season, whatever it might be, does not mean that life is over. And God has some things to say to his people. He tells them, be faithful in your tasks. Even in the midst of bondage, be faithful in your tasks. Build ye houses, dwell in them, plant gardens, and eat the fruit of them. <laughs> God says to his people, Romans 12 and verse 11, the Bible reminds us, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Church, just because we find ourselves in bondage, just because we're reaping maybe some of the consequences of bad choices, or, or maybe it's, it's, it's out of our control, we just find ourselves in a storm this morning, it doesn't mean that all of a sudden we have a pass to not be faithful anymore. Amen. We have a pass to slack off. We have a past to let some things slip. Oh, you, you don't understand what I'm going through. You don't understand where I'm at in my life. I deserve to step back from serving a little bit. I deserve to indulge in some flesh over here a little bit. God said, you might be in Babylon, but that doesn't mean that you get to sit around. Be faithful in your tasks. Be fruitful despite your trouble, God says to him. <laughs> he says, life isn't over just because things aren't going your way. Life isn't over just because you're under the chastising hand of God. No. Take ye wives, beget sons and daughters. Be fruitful, continue on. Be increased, not decreased, God tells his people. And again, that kind of goes against our thinking sometimes. We think of bondage as bad. We think of trouble as, as not fruitful, as not productive, as something to be, to be removed from as soon as possible. But God says you can be fruitful in your bondage. And he, in fact, goes as far as to command his people to do so. John 15 and verse 2, the Bible reminds us that every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. You see, God's not just about getting us to a certain point and then just saying, all right, time to sit back and rest on your laurels. You've, you've produced enough. No, he's, he's after more fruit in our lives. Amen. He's after more fruit. And, 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 and if you know anything about purging, you know anything about pruning? It's not really a, I mean, I've, I've never asked to plant this personally, but I would assume it's not really the most, <laughs> the most fun sensation to have your branches clipped off. <laughs> 
for the farmer, for the whoever it is to go in there and, 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 to, and to clip those branches, to clip the small ones, to clip even buds, I might say, so that that plant can be more productive, more fruitful. And I heard a preacher say this here recently, and it, man, it stuck with me. The father is never closer than when he is purging. You can't purge from far away. You got to be right up in there. Be fruitful. Be fruitful in the midst of your bondage. But thirdly, he says, be favorable in your temperament. <laughs> you see there at verse 7? Seek the peace. Seek the peace, he says, of the city whither I have caused you to be carried away captives. Just because you're in bondage doesn't give you a free pass to be grouchy, miserable, and just <laughs> a pain in the neck to everyone around you. <laughs> doesn't give us a free pass. Be favorable in your temperament. Colossians 3 and verse 15, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts to the which ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. He said, in the, in the midst of bondage, be thankful? Oh, yes. <laughs> be thankful that even in the midst of trouble, we have one we can run to. Amen. We have a shelter in the time of storm. We have a high tower. We have a shield. We have a buckler. God says to his people... <laughs> You can't get, you, I don't want you go into this place of Babylon where I brought you, brought you as captives and all of a sudden the testimony goes out the window. You're still God's people. Just because there's trouble doesn't mean the light is going out. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven is still in the Bible even when you're going through it. Again, I'm not saying this is easy. But I'm saying this is what our God expects of us, commands us to do, and what we can accomplish through the power of His Spirit. I'm telling you, there's few things more powerful than the testimony of a suffering Christian. When you, you look at them and say, well, there's no reason there should be a smile on your face, but there's one there anyway. Let your light so shine. The admonition of God, be faithful, be fruitful, be favorable. But I want you to see the aim of God next, the aim of God, because he's at work in our hard times. He's at work in our dry seasons. He is after something in the times when it seems like he's furthest away. And I want you to look down to verse number, verse number 12. We'll come back to verse 10 and 11, but let's go down to verse number 12. This is what God is after. In his people. Then shall ye call upon me. And ye shall go and pray unto me. And I will hearken unto you. And ye shall seek me. And find me. When ye shall search for me. With all your heart. This is where God's trying to get us. And I love the words that. That the Bible uses here. We see the aim of God. We, we see that first word, call. Then shall ye call unto me. You know what that call is? It's a plea for help. It's not a carefully worded, perfectly grammatical prayer. <laughs> it's just a cry. Can I put it this way? A bleat for help. Because <laughs> he is our shepherd and we are his sheep. I read a story here just the other day about, about a sheep back in 2022 that got separated from its herd on Conway or Conway Mountain in North Wales. And a lady who was vacationing up there on the mountain happened to, as she was hiking one day, happened to see the sheep down, way down far in a ravine and, and saw it down there and it wasn't really moving, it wasn't really doing much. And when she went back another day, it was still there in the same spot. She thought, man, something has to be wrong. And so she uh, you know, alerted the authorities, and, and they sent out some, some inspectors 
from the uh, is the, the the royals something or other for animal cruelty. It's, they have a they have a whole division over there for, for for the animals. But they sent out some folks to try to find this sheep and try to get it back. And they were able to go to the, the trail and and see where the sheep was. And it had now been four days since that sheep had been there and stuck in the same spot. And the, the brush was very thick there on the mountain and in and, and some of the places where they were trying to get to the sheep, the, the, the brush was as tall as a man was and they had to hack through there with, with, with machetes and with, with power tools and, and chainsaws and anything they could do to try to get to this sheep. But though they could see it from up high, when they actually got down to try to find where the sheep was, the brush was so thick, they were having difficulty locating where the sheep was. And so for hours they worked, but they weren't, they weren't having any luck in figuring out where the sheep was. And then one of the, one of the men had an idea. He said, what, what if we try to call to the sheep? And so they began to, and they're, they're, as best they could, mimic the bleat of a sheep and call out to the, to the, to the one that was lost. And to their amazement, the sheep replied. <laughs> <laughs> and they kept on working, kept on working, and an hour or two later, they were able to, as they, as they continued working, they'd call out again, and, and they would follow the sound of the sheep. And they were able to get to the, to the, to the you, the you, <laughs> and rescue her, and get her back to her herd. You know, sometimes it's not... It's not <laughs> That's all, we, that's all we have. We don't even have words anymore. We don't even have tears left to cry anymore. Help. Yeah. But can I tell you something? The ears of our shepherd are open to our cry. David said it this way, incline thine ear unto me, O Lord. Incline thine ear. And sometimes... God has to put us in bondage so that we remember we need him. And we'll cry out to him again. He says, call upon me and ye shall go and pray unto me. This is interesting to me that those two words would be used together, go and pray. That go there in indicates motion. It indicates a moving towards the one we're praying to. And can I say it this way, church? Sometimes we need to get up and we need to start heading, heading back home. <laughs> we need to get up and start heading towards him. And what's the Bible promise us in James 4 and verse 8? Draw nigh unto God and he will draw nigh unto you. Like the, the father of the prodigal son, he's, he's looking, watching that horizon. Say, oh, it, maybe today, maybe today my, my child's coming back. Maybe today I'll see his head come over the horizon there. Sometimes we sit and we stew in our bondage, don't we? We woe we, is me. Oh, I'm telling you, nobody's ever suffered like I've suffered. <laughs> I, I, maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm the only professional pity party planner around here, but I'm telling you, I'm real good at it. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. And I think of the, the, the lepers in, in First Kings, or Second Kings chapter 7, <laughs> who said, why, why sit we here until we die? Why are we just sitting here? We're gonna, we got to do something. And may God help us get to the place where we say we can't sit here any longer. Oh, we, we, we can't go another day without experiencing the presence and the sweet fellowship of our Savior. That we get fed up with the powerlessness. That we get fed up with the status quo. That we get fed up with seeing a prayer answered every three months. <laughs> and, and then that's it. And we say, God, we, we need you. God, we can't go this way anymore. We're not going to sit here until we die. God, we need you. Then we need to see you do something great. 
And then I want you to notice that third word. Not only does he he say, you'll call upon me, you'll go and pray unto me, but ye shall seek me. Ye shall seek me. And that word there carries with with it the idea to search intently. To search intently. (laughs) And I, 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 I go back to to that VBS story. I was, I was seeking my keys. <laughs> I was asking everybody, hey, have you seen some keys? I had one of those little carabiner hook things on there. You know, it's got a, got a red carabiner on there. Have you seen my keys? I'm asking kids. <laughs> have you seen my keys? <laughs> I'm searching every room in the church. I'm searching rooms I hadn't even been in. And I wonder when's the last time we sought the Lord like that. With a desperation. With a I, I cannot I, I cannot keep going until I find I find what I'm looking for, Jesus. We can seek a lot of things pretty intently. Sometimes we seek this intently. May we have the attitude of a a man by the name of Jacob, who God changed his name to Israel, who despite his flaws, despite his failures, said, I will not let thee go until you bless me. I'm not living another day without the blessing of God in my life. The aim of God, really to draw us to himself. It's sad. I mean, it's sad that God has to use trials and bondage and problems. <laughs> I mean, it'd be great if we could just seek him when everything was going well, but sometimes he's got to get us to a place where we have nowhere else to turn. He's got to get us to a place where everything else is stripped away. Everything we've leaned on before is taken away, and he's all that we have left. <laughs> But finally, I want you to see as we wrap up this morning the answer of God. The answer of God. (laughs) Look at verse number 10. For thus saith the Lord, that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you (laughs) and perform my good word towards you in causing you to return to this place. I don't know about you, but man, wouldn't it be cool if God visited us this week? Amen. Amen. If we seek him. Sometimes I think he's he's knocking. I mean, he's knocking. But we got the TV turned up too loud to hear his knock. I I didn't get any amens there, so I'm going to run by that one one more time. He's knocking, but we got the TV turned up too loud to hear his knock. Fill in the blank, whatever it is. We got, the, we, we got the world's earbuds in our ears, and we can't hear him knocking. He says, I will visit you. And he responds to the cry, to the, the prayer, to the seeking of his people with his presence. And boy, do we need the presence of God. I will visit you and perform my good word towards you. Oh my, oh my, don't. (laughs) Have you stopped and meditated on the promises of God lately? Oh my, we we could take the rest of the day and just talk about the promises of God and how they're available. And we have it all before us. The word of God, the promises of God. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. I will supply all your need. It's all before us. Like a grand buffet of the goodness of God. So why sit we out here on the curb starving to death when the buffet is available, has been bought and paid for with the precious blood of Jesus Christ? 
And the Father invites, come and dine. Come and dine. Oh, I'm telling you, the promises of God. But then he says, I'll cause you to return to this place. We see the plan of God. (laughs) Can I tell you, your bondage didn't knock God's plan off the rails. Can I say that again? (laughs) Your bondage didn't knock God's plan off the rails. He's still in control. And he can restore the years the locusts have eaten. He can bring you back to a place of usefulness. He can bring you back to a place of blessing. And if you're still breathing, he's not done with you this morning. He says in verse 11, for I know the thoughts that I think towards you. (laughs) Sayeth the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. My, if we could just get a hold of how our Father thinks about us. Because the devil, he tries to tempt us, tries to get into our ear when when bondage comes, when trouble comes. God doesn't love you anymore. He's turned his back on you. Oh, you you sing God is so good, but is he really? God says, the thoughts I think towards you are thoughts of peace. Not of vengeance. Not of, oh, you messed up. (laughs) We're going to hit you with some bondage and teach you a lesson. No, no. (laughs) And when we seek him, we can find that peace. The peace that passes all understanding. Verse number 14. Let's just read verse 12 and 13 again because they're good. Then shall ye call upon me and ye shall go and pray unto me and I will hearken unto you. And ye shall hear me and find me and ye shall search with me with all your heart. And can I say that 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 last part's important. When ye shall search with me with all your heart. But look at verse 14. And I will be found of you. (laughs) God said you seek me you'll find me I'm not out here playing hide and cosmic hide and seek you seek me and good luck because I'm a really good hider (laughs) I will be found of you saith the Lord and I will turn away your captivity and I will gather you from all the nations and from the places where I have driven you saith the Lord and I will bring you again into the place whence I caused you to be carried away captive. He can bring us back again. If you're here under the sound of my voice this morning and there was a time when God's presence was nearer and His power more evident in your life and His presence, His peace sweeter in your spirit, can I tell you He can bring you back there? He wants to bring you back there. And before us lay a great opportunity this week to seek the Lord while he may be found. To call upon him while he is near. The blessing of bondage is the fact that God is there. That's the blessing. And even in the midst of our trouble, we can seek him and we can find him. Can can I tell you the times when when God's been nearest to me are not the times when I've been on the mountaintop, but they're the times when I've been in the hospital room. (laughs) With my sweet wife, we had been married not too long. Found out the amazing news that we were expecting a child, only to very shortly thereafter find out that we had lost that child. And to be sitting in that hospital room, with, hey, what, what, what is going on? Waiting for doctors to do procedures and for things to pass and for just uh, not the most peaceful of environments, can I tell you? <laughs> not a place that I, I thought that I would find myself. But to feel the peace of God and the presence of God in that room as we began to just sing hymns together. I'll never forget it. I don't know what place maybe you dug yourself into or what place the Lord has brought you to this morning. But can I tell you, wherever it is, He wants to meet you there. He wants to minister to you. And He wants to do great and mighty things in your life. 
things you can't even imagine. May we see the blessings of bondage. And may our bondage cause us to call upon him and to seek his face with all of our heart. Lord, we love you this morning. There are many things in my life, Lord, where if I were in charge, <laughs> I would have skipped that chapter. But I would have missed out on what you wanted to do in those places. I pray, Lord, for your people this morning as we, as we come to a week of revival meetings, Lord. I pray you'd meet us where we're at today. I pray you would reveal yourself to us. I pray that we would run after you and that we would see great and mighty things accomplished this week. Lord, souls saved, hearts revived, lives back on track. And we'll be careful to give you the glory. We love you, Lord. Thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Brother Drew. What a blessing. I trust that's what you have been and will be doing this week is seeking the Lord and trusting him to work in our lives. And he said it right. What a wonderful opportunity we have right before us. And so all the way through next Sunday night, it just makes me want to, I don't know, get out of hanky and wave it. We get a chance to be in church that much. So praise the Lord. Thank you so much, Brother Drew. We appreciate it. All right, church begins in about 15 minutes. So. Uh,